questions where you stack different levels of these ideal dipoles on top of one another, calculate the A matrix B component of A, because that's all you need. And use the far field approximation to go from A to E. We wrote that formula on the board last time. It's really simple. It doesn't have to be algebraic if you're in the far field. And then you can get power and that sort of thing. To basically estimate what the, um, all the radiation, things like the radiation resistance, P gain, half power being with, all those fun things that uh, we defined in the other antenna lecture. And the hardest thing is going to be to calculate gain. Because remember from our previous lectures, gain is not just a value of radiated power. It's normalized against the entire uh, radiated system, right? So if I have an antenna, the way that I calculate gain, I basically have to say, okay, I've got a um, pointing vector drives power flux in every direction. I've got to integrate that over four pi steer radians to get the power in watts that that system is radiating. And then I have to calculate activity, which says, if what is the gain, what is the amount of power beyond what would be radiated in a system where we were only dealing with isotropic radiators. We took that same power that was radiated by this complicated system with lobes and main beams and side lobes and things. We added all that power up and just transmitted it isotropically. There is no such thing as an isotropic end, not for any particular fixed polarization. But we use that construct because it's such an intuitive and easy way to define the performance of it. I put a bit of power into an antenna. What would it look like if I just divided that power over four pi steer radians? Let it fall off one over r squared as it moved away. And then directivity tells you what is the actual radiated power relative to that amount. So sometimes the directivity is going to be greater than one, especially if you've got an antenna with some size and it's focusing power in a particular direction. Sometimes it's going to be less than one. In fact, there always has to be parts that it's less than one because antennas are just dumb hunks of metal. They don't produce gain like an amplifier. They can only focus in one direction or another. And if they're doing really a good job of focusing in one direction, by necessity, that must happen at the expense of the other directions. They can't get something for nothing. So when I, a radar antenna draws a thin beam, pointing towards somewhere along the horizon, and I'm getting 50 dBi of gain. Remember we measured gain in the dB scale. Units of dBi, decibels with respect to the spot of a person. For field energy, there are field engineers that have been working in this field for five or 10 years. They still make this mistake. Refer to the gain of an antenna in dB. Do that. Minus two. All of your questions were you? Yes. It really matters. So I, I do not want illiterate engineers graduating from my class. And warned. Um, <clears throat> and so, oh, yes. How does directivity relate to? Oh, that's a great question. That's, it's like you're reading from the script. Outstanding question. Directivity only tells you how good you are at focusing. Uh, that's radiating. Not all of the power that you put into an antenna gets radiated, right? And it's not just due to mismatch loss. Even the power that makes it into the antenna does not necessarily get radiated because there will be material losses involving conductivity on your metal, finite conductivity on your metal, resistance, ohmic loss, burning, heating up your antenna, radiating thermal energy, infrared radiation instead of RF radiation. And then also dielectric losses. 
And it could be at the antenna itself and the material you've used to make, make the antenna, or perhaps some of the materials in the surrounding uh, environment that the fields are strong enough to couple into and make a significant amount of loss. And so that is actually the, the difference between directivity gain. They're equal to one another, except you multiply by something called a radiation efficiency. So if you have a directivity, a true directivity function, integrate it over four, if you average it over four pi stir radians, you get one, always. The normalized uh, description focusing power. Gain is not like that because you're, you're dealing with realistic antennas that are passive. All bets are off if you actually put an amplifier on your antenna somewhere. But if there are passive components on there, if you integrate or average the gain over four pi to radians, your scale always get less than one because I'm taking directivity and multiplying by an efficiency that's. Yes? Four pi stir. Four pi stir radians. So the, the two dimensional four pi spherical, they, they, the, the measure for two dimensional angle is stir radians. Do you know that word? Oh. I'm going to go back and flash all of your math teachers. So two pi radians is the number of the amount of radians that uh, you sweep out during the course of an entire circle. Four pi stir radians is the amount of two-dimensional stir radians that you sweep out when you integrate over a sphere. Good question. Thank you for stopping me for that. I never know what your background is for these things. Sometimes I think it's 1996 all over again, and I'm teaching antennas that had way more math and not nearly as many applied classes as you. It's not a bad thing. Crush the old man that wants to pine for the good old days. Yet, anyway. So this actually has to do with the fact that if you integrate over uh, the radians, you have a sine theta angle of elevation, theta d phi. Integrate theta from zero to pi, and phi, my azimuthal angle, zero to pi. You really do need almost like a whole course to study multivariable integration. My golly, you've got one, don't you? Okay. The idea of azimuth, you're integrating from zero to pi. Elevation, you're integrating from zero to pi. Don't go from zero to two pi or else you're going, you're double counting this area. You don't need to go from zero to two pi to get to this area. You just need to go to zero to pi and then go over in azimuth, 180 degrees. But anyway, if you actually go through and actually do the math with this, you get four pi. When he splices four pi steer radius, they're talking about all the angles across a two dimensional sphere. Oh, yes. For using dBi instead of dB, is there like a, an actual magnitude difference? There really isn't. It, it's 10 log base 10, the value. There is dB. Whenever you put something in the dB scale, it's always with respect to a reference, right? So if I'm comparing two powers, I just call that, you know, divide one power into the other, take 10 log base 10, that ratio, and that's dB. Um, and you said, wait a second, in my circuits class, sometimes we took 20 log base 10. Yeah, it's when you were dealing voltages and currents, power is always proportional to voltage squared or current squared, so you have to take 20 instead of 10, right? I, I thought that, that my instructors, when I was an undergraduate, that they were just being capricious. Tuesday, they would take 20 dot log bet 10. Monday, they would take 10 log bet 10. And Wednesday, grab bag. And I, I just, nobody really clued me in on that until later in life. I clicked, clicked on it. 
power versus amp. Now, because db is always referenced to something, if the reference is not in explicit, we usually change the unit to make it clear what the reference is. So for example, when we were problems in this class involving power, we have something something dBm, decibel milliwatts. Or if it's a higher power level, we like to reference with respect to watts, dB capital W. And that just means that, yeah, this is a unit of power and it's referenced logarithmically to a base unit of milliwatts or watts. Now with the case of antennas, the dBi, 99.99% of the antennas that you will deal with in this class and beyond even, will be referenced with respect to isotropic radiation. So we always put the little i at the end of the dB. In some older deprecated literature or some random spec sheets, sometimes you'll see dB little d. That's decibel with respect to dipole. If you had a half wave dipole with 2.1 dB i of gain, you'd have to, the dBd value would be whatever uh, the value you measure on your antenna minus the 2.1 peak BD. Uh, but as I said, that's kind of, uh, because antenna engineers used to use dipoles as reference measurement elements in all of their measurements, especially at lower frequencies, that became the reference. And so you would just plot the raw data from that measurement using your dipole and the reference would be a dipole so you'd have to remember to add 2.1 dB to everything. But that almost never happens anymore. But it, you will probably still see it every once in a blue moon. Uh, Jeremy? Is that because they just didn't want to do some of the other math for isotropic or and they just had access to dipole measurements? Uh, this was probably that the byproduct from what I've seen of, uh, of uh, all the range rats measuring antennas and just out of practicality. I put, if you think about how our antenna test range is set up, I've got a device under test, an antenna under test, that I want to spin. And I've got to excite it with something at a physical distance away so I can kind of back off my free space equation. And also, quite often, there will be another calibration measurement you make by replacing the device under test with a dipole or some other realistic antenna. I just told you earlier that I, you can't make an isotropic antenna. You can only make it really an omnidirectional antenna. That's another point of thing uh, that I want to bring up in this class. There's no such thing as an isotropic antenna, even though we reference all of our antenna designs against that. However, uh, the term omnidirectional, we will use that quite a, a bit. I use the term omnidirectional in distinction to an isotropic antenna. Iso means three in all sides. Omni, if an antenna is omnidirectional, that means it has a constant gain or directivity along a plane usually the horizon for like a dipole that's standing there. So if you think about it, I'm on a range, I've got my excitation, I've got my antenna that I'm going to spin, but I need to calibrate out the path loss so that I know I'm measuring actual loss of the antenna. So I take a baseline pattern with a dipole, which means if I calibrate the power that I get from spinning the antenna to the power that I get with the dipole, I've automatically made a DBD measurement. Uh, and if I don't want to go back and do the math to correct things, that's, I just slept DBD instead of DBI plus something on it, and plot is valid. So I think that was the rationale. Hi, uh, Jeremy. The reason you can't do an isotropic. Well, it has to do with the, the pattern. Like, because you have a current source here, yeah. that current source makes an isotropic vector magnetic potential. The problem is that when you go to higher elevation angles, the contribution gets foreshortened to the point where you're right above it, it's a null. And that just has to do with the fact that I've got physical current here, small radiator. You say, well, okay, what if I had uh, uh, what if I superimpose that? What if I now had two physical currents? One up, one down. Could I make something that was a little bit more up? Isotropic was low. Well, now I get the same amount this way and the same amount this way. 
But in this direction, they would like either constructively or destructively interfere and give me a different value for my gradient of the system. So it turns out that it becomes like a, a you can mathematically show that the problem is a lot like ironing out the lumps of a carpet. As soon as you add something to fix the null that you made in the previous thing, uh, you've, you've added a null or a distortion somewhere else. The only way I've seen people even get close to isotropic antennas is by playing games with polarization. Making it so that it's circular polarization in one direction, maybe it transitions to air up here and then back to the op opposite sense polarization over. So I still would not see an isotropic if I took an, my little linear antenna and moved it around. So measure field strength. If I, you know, maybe you can get it so that the electromagnetic flux density pointing vector watts per meter squared uh, is roughly equal if you don't pay any attention. But the best you Otherwise, mathematically impossible to make uniform component on the theta direction, for example. Always discontinuities. Good question. Any other questions? the blue jeans chat. The case for this problem, too, on the homework. Oh, it's the entire quantity <laughs> at the end. So what, what you see on the left-hand side of the matching circuit that has to be complex conjugated. That, that has to be Z naught plus zero. Okay. You at home. Um, let's launch into our lecture. Okay, let's look at vertical dipoles. I want to highlight a few. I want to present it. Stop being so helpful, Microsoft PowerPoint. Okay. Well, slideshow. Begin. Vertical dipole arrays. So here's one of the problems, and if there's a similar, striking similarity to your homework three problem, we have a set of dipoles. In fact, this is highly representative of how people make base station antennas for the cellular environment. You see these, they will even bring in a couple from show and, show and tell on Monday. Didn't bring anything this time. Uh, we'll bring in a tower of uh, stacked dipoles that you attach to a uh, metal tower or whatever you want to. Uh, I've seen lots of different type versions of this. If you want an omnidirectional antenna, you can use a bunch of stacked dipoles. Half dipole here, or half dipole here. And you, phase, and you feed them in phase so that they give maximum constructive interference along the horizon. In fact, some base stations are so sophisticated, you can actually dial in a little bit of what's called down tilt. And what that means is that they've just added some phase shift to the stacked dipole so that now the peak interference pattern is not on the horizon, but it's down 10 degrees, 5 degrees, whatever you dial it. Some of these uh, nice base station antennas, you have a setting where you can electrically or mechanically down tilt them. You are mechanically down tilting them. That means a person has to go up the tower and there's a gimbal that these things are placed on. You adjust it, you push it down, and you measure it. 10% down tilt, or 10 degree down tilt, just like the engineer told me to do. Then you go back home. Then there's another method called electrical down tilt, where you electrically introduce a phase. 
things. And the electrical isn't always all electrical anyway. Sometimes it's there's a, a mechanical drive in there so that you send a signal up there and is that one 10 degrees down tilt and it will like move a little arm that adjusts all the feeds to the antenna mechanically so that there's an additional 10 degrees of phase shift from here to here to here to here to here, whatever gives you an up down tilt. That, that is called sometimes also electrical down tilt, even though you're not using all solid state devices. Uh, Jeremy, you first. Uh, is that the same idea as a phased array? Yes, that is exactly what a phased array. The key to designing phased array is not only the geometry of the antennas, in this case we've constrained ourselves to the exact dipoles because we want coverage all over here, but we want to confine the beam to here. Design the geometry of the antennas, but then there's also this whole aspect of the feed network. How do you introduce the phase delay? The phase delays, the phase, uh, different phases of the antennas. We want it to be a dynamic phase. Make a phase array just by changing the length of the feed wires to these, and it'll have a really nice pattern, but we won't be able to change it. You gotta make a feed network. It has to be low loss, which is tricky when you're feeding a bunch of elements. Uh, and then if you want dynamism, you gotta figure out how to change those electrical pathways relative to one another. Sometimes that's done by you know, brute force mechanically changing the transmission line size. Uh, in more sophisticated designs, you do it with phase shifters, electrically tunable phase shifters. For example, magnetic material that has a little response at RF. Um, then you wave through it, encounters this magnetic, magnetic material in the transmission. Slows down wave, but if you bias it with extra mag with a DC magnetic field, saturate the permeability, the wave can speed back up. There you can dial in, you can even by analog, you can dial in different phases. Now those are usually pretty sophisticated, but if you want to do it, Or even hardwired. If you, the buyer is interested in omnidirectional antenna with peak gain from along the horizon. And that's really the scenario what we have here. So, what we're taking is the half wave dipole standing wave current, which is by Z over lambda minus lambda over for the half wave dipole. And then we're just replicating that up and down. The, the link. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. So how does shifting the phase actually change the angle? Like, if it's yeah. the outward, how does shifting the phase? It would, it would shift the phase, like, vertically, right, when you're shifting the phase? That's right. So one of the ways to see this, there, there, there's a couple ways. I'll give you the math, mathematical way, and then I'll give you the way that's easier to visualize, of course, to not the same. <laughs> right? So uh, mathematically, if, in, let's say we call this... Uh, Center element zero degrees is referenced. Have a standing wave. Just a little taper to, but it's a standing wave and it's zero degrees. It's all going to be the same phase for that particular element. Then let's say I feed this element with a slightly shorter. So it's going to have. Uh, let's say, 10 degree difference. Well, I can put that in the radiation equations and solve that system for these types of phase shifts that I added to my current distribution. To add the integral, all you got to do is integrate minus infinity or plus infinity. Pick up all those phase changes. But it's easier to grasp what's going on if you just make some physical geometrical. Let's say, this is a shorter, I, I break my signal apart, shorter phase here first, and then here. But these are not going to be in exactly in phase along the horizon, because from here on out, the two waves are traveling the exact same distance to the horizon. There's no additional phase change. And they're not entirely in phase, so we would call that partially constructive interference. 
there won't be T gain. T gain should happen if I look in a direction that's up in this quadrant somewhere, because this path was shorter and this path took longer to get here, but now from the point of view of this direction, this guy travels a little bit of extra distance. And then once it does that, in this direction, it's now completely aligned with this wave. Travels forward like that. Perfect constructed there. And then the opposite might happen somewhere at a particular location down here where yeah, I send a short wave here and it's already got a jump start. It gets even more of a jump start if it's going radiating in this direction. So that by the time this guy comes over here, now we're propagating in unison in a parallel direction down here. Total phase difference is so high that I get destructed now. Partial or whole. So that's physically what's happening when we stack dipoles like this. So this particular problem, which is very similar to your homework, says, well, what if we have six of these, or four of these, or ten of these? So the math of this is fairly straightforward. Okay. Uh, first of all, here's our re result from the half-wave dipole lecture, in to 6 It's actually the, the generic result for Z-directed current. I know what the current distribution is. Uh, plug it into this equation to get my A. From A, I get the NH. The halfway dipole was easy to work with. I just take this cosine KZ prime source, stick it in here, calculate from minus lambda over 4 to lambda over 4. And what I get here is, I do that math, that's one of those integrals you have to look up in the back of the calculus book, or from alpha or whatever. I don't, I can't solve that one. <laughs> so here is your vector magnetic potential, power density, Vector little formula that lets you shortcut the field field expressions. Here's my full on uh, result, and if I simplify it in terms, I get the half wave dipole radiation at cosine squared theta divided by sine squared theta. That is not a very easy term to visualize geometrically going, what's going on. But it, it's really not that bad if you look at the limiting cases. It's really just like a dumbbell, like a sine squared theta term of a Hertzian dipole. But because it's a little bit longer than a Hertzian dipole, it's just a little bit more squinted up. There's still a null in the z direction. Because if I put cosine of zero, that's one, i over two, times 1 is pi over 2 times cosine squared <coughs> of 0, or pi over 2 is 0. Now, wait a second, there's a sine squared 0 in the denominator. Got to do a little bit tall score. Remember that one from calculus. You'll find that the 0 is more dominant than the 0 in the denominator. So it wins out for theta equal to 0. No radiation. Peak radiation occurs along the horizon. What we find there is that theta equals 90 degrees or pi over 2. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0. 0 times pi over 2 is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. So this is at a maximum. Uh, and sine, pi, sine squared pi over 2 is also 1. It show that this expression is maximized along the horizon for 
Okay, so we use that fundamental result from the previous lecture. And look at this. This looks very intimidating. I'm going to integrate across the entire length of stacked half-wave dipoles with sinusoidal current. Much harder than your homework problem, by the way. And here's I've got the I absolute value of cosine kz prime gets me jkz prime cosine there. The basic expression for my z-directed line current. And instead of um, absolute values, I'm going to write these with discontinuities using a summation. That keeps everything nice and smooth and analytic. So basically, I'm going to take the absolute value away when this is positive, which it is for like five intervals in lambda. Like my first dipole, we're calling that zero degrees, we'll just let that be positive. Then we go to the next one, it should be negative value, cosine becomes negative. Then we're just going to have a negative one over to the end. So I just make these little, what I'm really doing is just superimposing a bunch of alternately over uh, basic dipoles. Power of dipoles. And when I do that, what's nice about this is that once I've done that, I basically get an expression that looks exactly like I have. In the previous slide, this is actually an extremely important result in antenna engineering. We're going to actually formally cover arrays in a few more weeks, but what I really want you to see mathematically is the key principle for array theory already emerging from just the simple math exercise that you're working on homework. It's to be kind of like a prelude to, to uh, array theory. I've got this current integral, integral that looks exactly like a half-wave dipole. And it'll evaluate to the this exact same pattern of the half-wave dipole. So here I have the pattern of the half-wave dipole, and I've got a phase term here. And because this is common to every single summation, I can actually take this out of the summation and even out of the absolute value side because it's always positive in the system. This, you can use a really simple geometrical identity. This uh, is a geometrical series, and uh, if you just use your rule for geometrical series, you can massage this into this sign, capital N, the number of dipoles you've stacked up. Pi over 2 times cosine divided by sine pi over 2. So something interesting has happened mathematically here. I stacked up a bunch of half-wave dipoles. I get some giant super antenna. But it turns out that the radiation pattern splits up into two pieces. The part that's only dependent on the element pattern is the half-wave dipole. And then there's a, another section that's only dependent on where you put them. So that really is, is interesting because it turns out that we're going to learn later in theory and in ray theory is if I wanted to stack patch antennas in this exact same geometry, I would only have to change this term to the radiation pattern of the patch antenna, to the element. And I would do this one the same. Or if I took the half-wave dipoles and I spread them out into a crazier pattern, I would just have to add up these phase shifts and all of the arrays, array element points, recalculate this part, this part would stay the same. And so we see, we're going to learn in more detail later on when we cover arrays, all arrays have element pattern multiplied by geometrical array factor. Call it the array factor. Only due to geometry of the array, and this term is only due 
elements that you've put there. Definitely. And you can make really complicated arrays where that's not true, where you just put a lot of different elements get a geometry. Well, for the most part, if you use the same element in every factorization. And I have a few example calculations here. Now, I've got dipole beam, array pattern, when I deal with power. This tells us if I put I current into the system, this is my radiated power. Power that's watts per meter squared as a function of angle. All I have to do to get the total power transmitted Integrate this over 4 pi to rating. That's it. All you have to do. This is not possible by pen and paper techniques. This is, you have to write a little script for in MATLAB or people even try to work these in Excel. Whatever you, I don't care. Whatever your mathematical computational package of choices, figure out a way to numerically integrate or the one that you come up with for your. Because you'll need that total power to calculate the directivity. If I don't tell you otherwise, in a test problem or a homework problem, I ask you to calculate gain, but I don't give you an efficiency. You may always assume the efficiency is on. Relative. If it's a well-designed antenna, you'll get a radiation efficiency. 80%. 80%. 70%. So, you may always make that assumption if it is not explicitly stated for you. Ah, yes. So, what's being numerically integrated to? So, here we've got power density as a function of beta, independent of azimuthal angle, right? Because it's a radially, radially symmetrical system. So I've got power density watts per meter squared. I need to integrate this, I need to just pick a constant r. From the shell distance away from this, and I need to integrate over 4 pi steer radians. So, what you do Way that you work all of these problems for calculating the directivity or the gain of something. Take the magnitude of your pointing vector. And you use following di differential elements. Zero to pi, theta, zero to two pi with respect to phi. And so whatever you came up with in your radiation analysis, in this case, it's, you have to cut and paste this, this integral. And if you've done it right, the r squared should always cancel with the r squared in the denominator. There should be no r dependence. It makes sense that this is a lossless free space medium. It doesn't matter if you make the circle one meter around your antenna or 1,000 meters around your antenna. Power should always be the same. Watts, the watts per meter squared is a lot lower. It's one over r squared fall off. When I go around the 4 pi r squared surface area of a sphere and collect all those pointing vector contributions, I get a constant. Now, let's graph this. So, for example, I put a put together a little program, graphs and calculates this. So what happens when you put one amp in to the antenna? One of the nice things is that you know how many amps you've put into this antenna, and you've calculated total power. We know that total power transmitted is equal to one half. <laughs> Input current magnitude squared the radiation resistance. 
So if I calculate this from here, I know what my test current was, so to speak, and get that calculation. Are you one amp? Then I can calculate what my radiation resistance for this. I know this squared I can solve for radiation. And if I have just one of those, I get the half wave dipole pattern. I think this is done in dB, so that this is basically. I think I've normalized here. It falls off and it becomes a null here. And does anybody remember from the previous lectures if I wanted to calculate the half power beam width? Walk me through what I would do in that. Here's my peak direction of gain. Half power beam width says. Okay, what's the range of radiation within my main beam that falls within plus or minus three? And there's a big point, and these are increments of 10 dB, so the half hour beam would fall somewhere where the dotted line intersects the blue radiation pattern. Okay, right now for a half wave dipole at 78 degrees. And look, yep, there it is. Comes out in the map. I noticed that I, I report a couple other interesting parameters that we may not have talked about in this little script, which I'll go ahead and make it available. Side lobe level. Side lobes are the additional lobes that antennas pick up when they get electrically large. This is just one half wave dipole. It does not have any side lobes. It has a main lobe, and that's it. It goes to zero to the z-axis, and you don't see anything else. Normally, side lobe level is defined as what in dB, what is the difference between the peak gain and the peak gain of the next side lobe, which will become more apparent as we look at some. And the radiation resistance was 73 ohms, which I think we talked about in the last video. Okay, let's say we have a vertical array of four half wave dipoles that are in phase stacked above each other. Look at what their gain pattern does here. I've got radiation on the sides here. I'm picking up side lobe. Side lobe level that was estimated for this one is like 11.2 dB. That this first side lobe is 11 dB. And then the peak gain for this guy is about 8.7 dBi. Again, I need the total power so I can reference the power density peak with what an isotropic power antenna would have delivered to that location. And you can see that as we keep on adding elements of dipoles here, six elements, notice what happens. The gain gets higher. The gain is now 10.5 dBi. My half power, power, power beam width gets smaller, eight degrees of half power beam width compared to the 78 degrees we started out with one element. Side load level goes down a little bit, doesn't change as much. The radiation resistance of this system. And I pick up more and more side lobes. There's A, N. And here's a really nice example of a commercial base station antenna. It's got a stack of, well, it's probably patches or something that looks kind of like a dipole from the front. The individual elements have the same kind of rounded, globular uh, lobe radiation pattern, but when you stack them up, shrinking of the half power beam went in this direction and gain in the peak. Increase in the peak. This particular antenna is vertical, 
straight from a spec sheet, so you can see what the spec sheet looks like. Is water voltage standing wave ratio 1.8 to 1. Remember, Viswar is the peak amplitude on your transmission line feeding this antenna, divided by the minimum. So 1.8 is not super great, but most of the power is actually making it into really a measure of reflection. If my Viswar is high, that means I've got a lot of weight for from the antenna. It's a bad mismatch. This is usually the worst case scenario across the band. Of The 3 dB pattern, it's 120 degrees in this direction, and it's about 8 degrees in this direction. Oh, maybe they used 10 elements stacked up there. We reverse engineer that from this little analysis we just did. And gain, peak gain of 15 dBi. Quick question, brain teaser. Said that this stack of dipoles gives you 12.8 dBi, but this particular base station somehow got like 3 dB or so higher than that. The difference is a factor of two. Double the power, yeah. So how did they get it? Why did they stack up 10 dipoles or 10, 10 somethings and get more gain direction? Stacking up these dots. Remember, this antenna elements in here start off with a little bit of bias in this direction because it's a 120 degree sector, not covering the entire horizon. It's got a sector of only 120 degrees. So it probably selected some elements like patches, and also, there's all sorts of tricks at base station. They're focusing energy already 120 degree sector. So by nature, we would expect this to have a better focusing, even if it wasn't any larger in this direction. Yeah, um, it kind of falls in here. Um, all the previous issues that you that was only azimuthal. Uh, elevation cut, oh. that's right. So, how does that show in the 3D? Yeah, yeah. So, all of these um, electrical dipoles that are stacked in the Z direction are all radially symmetric, right? Be almost fun if you could visualize the antenna pattern. Just view this as a solid of revolution. Take this, spin it in your mind. That's actually what the antenna pattern. That's actually not true, as you said. It follows from what we were just talking about here. This guy's going to look like that, but it's going to be focused and biased in one particular sector. They have all sorts of other interesting eyes. And the weight that's important. Figure out how what, how strong of a um, mounting do you need for this antenna to put it on a tower? It'll tell you the length and the width because wind shear is an important part of uh, the design. You have to figure out if you withstand against the mechanical tail. It has some sort of gimbal attached to it that would allow it to be tilted up. 25 degrees. In height. Oh, here's a pattern. They even have a pattern. Always one of the reasons I like pulling spec sheets off of that Stella Doratus uh, manufacturing website is that uh, I always provide their patterns. Never trust. The manufacturer with something to hide, like a car, used car dealer that won't let you test drive the car before you buy it. Oh, it's 16 dBi, 120 degree half power beam of fuel bump. 
So here's another good example of a base station. I have license band 10 dpi, 180 degrees, half of a plane, 20 degrees second. Effects here. You will see uh, a good of an example on this spec. But on this spec sheet, you'll see a front to back ratio. That is a very common metric. We haven't talked about that one yet. But whenever you have an antenna that has a bias, one, one particular. Uh, one of the metrics that people look at is the front back ratio. How good is the front gain compared to the As many of these antennas and cellular is no different, trying to discriminate your coverage. It's not enough just to get gain in one direction. You want to suppress radiation in the back direction because you might be reusing this frequency over here and you don't want to contribute interference. Cellular networks are interference limited. And so it doesn't do well if you have a lot of gain in one direction, but you're still spraying a little bit of radiation everywhere. Thank you. This front to back ratio, and you can get that either one of two ways. You can either get a really good peak gain, or uh, you can significantly suppress the radiation. Okay. Diagrams. I want to end with one thing. Let me raise this slideshow. showed you a stack of diamonds. What would happen if I took instead of one quarter arms, transmission line, took three one quarter segments on the top and the bottom bar of my transmission line, and I bent this whole thing back and did it from a common center point, such that it looked like this. It was a three halves wavelength dipole. Would that give me the same gain as what I've described in my stack of individual dipoles? Well, think about this. You know that I've got to backtrack from this scenario, standing wave interference pattern. Means divide this up into thirds each. Got one whole inter uh, standing wave sinusoidal hump of current, one whole sinusoidal hump of current down here. Go in at the same direction. But here's a quarter wavelength here, and here's a quarter wavelength here. I have a sinusoidal hump of current. However, there's an inflection point, which means the current's going to go down. What kind of pattern does that have? No, exactly. It's not a peak gain along the horizon. Why? Because these two components are constructively interfering along the horizon, but I have a third component that's destructive. I'm not going to get my peak contribution there. My peak contribution is probably going to be off axis somewhere. I'll have a divot along the horizon because this thing is flipped. So if I wanted to build these antennas, what I would not do is what I've drawn up here, where I just take a transmission line and I bend it back. 
That's not helpful. Instead, what I do is I take a transmission line, put it off multiple times into other transmission lines, feed a bunch of stack dipoles in unison. Brain teaser number one. Brain teaser number two. Okay, wait a second. What if go to two one quarter wavelength? This is a sinusoidal taper. Send it back. Have a full wave dipole. Does this start doing a fair Yes, it does. Would this have higher gain than a half wave dipole on the horizon? It would. Do we ever use this in practice? No, there's something else wrong with this. Would the constructor interference not be very focused in one? No, it would be okay. You would, you would get it in along the horizon, and then the half power beam would, would be smaller than a half wave dipole. It would be 78 degrees. And like But what, here's the, I'll, I'll give you a hint. Look at the feed point of this sample. I saw this from the way I've drawn it. But what is the input current? Zero. No matter what voltage you feed this antenna, there's a current null at this point. Means your equivalent impedance for this antenna is going to be voltage over zero. Open circuit. This is a great radiating system. Just can't get any power into it. So Can actually make this work if you're a little bit clever. One way that people do this is make a structure like this. Quarter wavelength down here, three quarter wavelengths up here. Look what happens. Here. Oh, but wait a second, I have an inflection point here. So, what I'll do, I'm going to combine two tricks. To take this part of the wire out, I'm either going to replace it with a ferrous material where the wave propagates very slowly, standing current, the equivalent to a half wavelength is squished down, or I'll just make a little spiral. This introduces 180 degrees of phase change in a very small region. So it doesn't contribute to radiation, but it does slow things down so that when I'm back up here, got the same uh, 